everyone. Uh, and, uh, joining us here, did everyone find the place all right? Anyone have any trouble? Has everyone been to the cafe before out there? Right, really good. We've got young kids, so it's, uh, we can actually have a hot meal there, so we really like that place. We can send them outside and uh, actually enjoy a meal, so it's a really good spot there. Um, has anyone seen any of Birdie Wells' content on Facebook before? Any videos before? No? Um, Suburbanite? Has anyone seen any of Suburbanite's work or Anna's stuff before? No? All new to it? Fantastic. So tonight is just a bit of an introduction to the businesses, how we work, what we can and can't do for you. Uh, we'll go through all that today. Uh, is anyone looking at buying a property within the next two years? Has anyone got that as a goal within two years to buy a property? Yes? What about 12 months? Anyone within 12 months? Maybe, maybe six months. Is anyone ready to go? They're just kind of doing their final research. So it's that one to two year period. So this is a great time just to get some education around the property market, finance and conveyancing, uh, give you a good understanding of all the different aspects of, uh, of what you need to know and some of the terminology involved in it. Uh, one quick slide we have to go through. Uh, all the information given you today by all the speakers is general advice only, so it's not specific to your situation. Uh, if you want advice about your situation, you need to go and speak to those individual businesses yourself, okay? So please take this as general advice. We don't know your situation, so uh, uh, formal slide, but we have to do this one. All right, so today we've got three promises to you. Uh, the first promise that we have to you is that we are going to provide you with value today. Um, is anyone on guard that we're gonna sell them something today? Is anyone ready for the big pitch or the big sale? Yep, all right, so at the end. Uh, there's no sale, there's no pitch. Uh, what do we get out of it? So if you like the speakers here today and you like the businesses, you may choose to work with us in the future. That's as simple as it is, right? So there's no sell, there's no hard pitch at the end. We'll give you the information, we'll give you everything. Um, in return, uh, we want something back from you. So we'll give you information, we want some information back. So everybody at their feet will have a feedback form. At the end of it, if you can just give us some feedback, it helps to improve these nights and uh, make them better and better. So we'll give you value, you give us some feedback on how we went. Uh, the second one is that we're gonna tell you the truth. So we're gonna give you the honest opinion. Uh, we'll let you know not everyone here will buy a property. Some people will, some people won't. Uh, and it will take time. So those people who have those uh, ideas that will take one to two years is, uh, is certainly a good step. It does take time to build towards that property purchase. It's not something you can kind of plan to do and, and do in the next month. Uh, it does take time, but we'll certainly be honest with you on uh, what your position is and, and how you can go about doing it. Um, the third one is, is that we are here to have a conversation with you. We're not professional speakers. It's not our job to stand up here and speak. Um, none of the speakers here tonight are professional speakers. They've all got their own jobs as mortgage brokers and buyers agents. So we're here to have a conversation with you. So please get involved, please interact. Um, that certainly allows you to learn a lot more and uh, take a lot away from it. Um, anyone know what these are? Anyone? Close? Anyone else? These are bribes, okay? Answer a question, get a bribe, all right? So if, uh, if you answer those questions, we'll get rid of these and try and get rid of all these chocolates tonight. Um, first speaker for tonight, so we have Gareth from Suburbanite talking first. Now Gareth is a practicing uh, valuer. He's a licensed buyer's agent and he has close to 20 years of experience. Now, for those who don't know Suburbanite, uh, they're there to assist clients in purchasing the best property, uh, possible investment properties around Australia. Their aim is to help buyers avoid the get rich quick schemes that are out there everywhere, uh, avoid the scams and give you quality independent advice. So please welcome Gareth. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so yes, I am definitely not here to sell you anything. I work for a firm called Suburbanite. We help people invest in property. I, this is a, a presentation for first home buyers. So I'm gonna to talk to you about property, but the service that we offer, the service that we sell is for property investors. So probably on your, on your, on your next step in your property journey. But tonight here, I'm, I'm here to talk about um, first home buying, about property in, in, in general. Um, I am here to tell the truth. I'm a property valuer. I don't get to tell people what they want to hear. I get to tell them the truth. Um, a lot of people don't like that, but it's about getting it right and getting it right every time so that um, the, the world can move in the, in the right direction, I suppose. Um, and yeah, it is, it is about a, a little bit about our conversation, as, um, as Nathan said. So we're here just to, to, to give you some information, to help you build your knowledge um, about uh, what, what we do, but also about what you'll be doing in the next few years when, you, when you're looking at the property market. So, 
Um, a little bit about myself. I work with Anna Porter. Um, Anna's a bit of a celebrity around here, even though um, we do stuff at Canterbury uh, Bulldogs. We are based in the Shire. Um, we've been in the Shire for six years, I think. I've been with the company for three years. Um, Anna and myself, uh, we run around all day um, talking to people about investing in property. We, we um, uh, work with uh, mortgage brokers, financial planners and accountants to help their clients, um, the, the, the mums and dads uh, and the first time investors get, uh, get into the property market and make sure they don't, don't make a mistake. Uh, I like my job. Uh, my job is a lot of uh, this sort of stuff. Uh, we joke that, uh, um, about my expense account and I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's worth joking about. It. It's pretty serious stuff. Um, but that's, that's me. Um, Anna, uh, and a bit more of, um, a bit more of a serious take on it because it's her business. And so she sort of watches the pennies a bit more. Um, she's got a bit of a media profile. She's got a little book out there, um, as well. And, um, she's been, uh, almost as long as me. So she's been a property valuer for about 13 or 14 years. I've been a valuer for 18 years. Um, and between us, uh, we have done a lot of property valuation work. So a little bit about my experience as a valuer. I've worked in Sydney, I've worked in Melbourne. I've valued over 10,000 houses and apartments in that time. I've also valued factories and land, you know, industrial land, office buildings, uh, whole unit buildings. I've done uh, a whole portfolio for defence housing. I've done uh, hundreds and hundreds of repossessions. And that's where um, I get a lot of the... Uh, um, uh, a lot of the value we add when we're buying property, it's about knowing what's a bad property and what to just walk away from. So um, uh, that's, that's part of the service. Um, why do we do what we do? Why do, why do we do this at Suburbanite? Why do we help people with their investment property? Um, it's because there are heaps of sharks out there. Uh, we're in an industry that is pretty much unregulated. I went to university for five years. I worked as a valuer for several years, about three or four years. Then I joined the Australian Property Institute. I became a certified practicing valuer. I maintain my professional development every year. I've got to do all sorts of courses and things to do that. Four years ago, I did an eight hour online course and became a buyer's agent. There's next to nothing to it. So if you are dealing with a buyer's agent, you want to make sure that you are dealing with someone that is working for you and not for the, uh, someone else that's selling a property. Um, so where our real motivation is to save people from the sharks that are in the industry. They are, they're, 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 it's hard to say the majority, but a significant minority of the industry are crooks and they're just lining their own pockets. Um, we charge a fee. We charge a fee for our service and that means we're upfront about what we do. You engage us to do a job for you. We do the job. We're working for you. Um, now, what we do is we buy, um, we buy property around the country and what we look for when we, when we do that is uh, just the, the best property that we can find for our, for our customers. Um, but when I say the best property, it's about understanding your needs and that's what you need to do. You understand, need to understand if you're looking at a property for investment um, and you're looking at those, uh, that, that sort of long-term goal, you're looking to make sure that, that it, it will achieve those goals and you don't get swept up. And it is hard to say it, but you've got to keep your emotions out of it. Even when you're buying as a place to live, unless you're buying your forever home, which you're probably not going to do on your first home, um, you need to really assess uh, the market where that, that property sits in. You need to assess uh, uh, things like the, the, su the supply and the, uh, coming, the upcoming supply of that a similar product. So is the market going to be flooded with that type of property? Is it the appropriate for the market that is in? If, if, there, if it's a one bedroom apartment in a, in a suburb full of four bedroom houses, it's probably inappropriate and it's not the sort of thing that's going to have a broad market appeal. Um, uh, now, you've got, to, uh, you've got to take all of the news. This is just a little slide, but there's, there's, lots, of, there's lots of noise when you're looking at property, everyone's an expert. Um, everyone's got an opinion. Uh, those two things don't mean the same thing. Uh, but there's even even so-called experts can have opinions. We don't agree with all of them. Uh, this guy's actually back in the market now, talk, talking about another crash. Yes, the city market is going through a correction. But um, if we'd listened to uh, Harry when he said that there was going to be a crash, um, we can see here. Uh, there's your, your, your GFC. The market went negative. The black line is the um, uh, national, uh, the, all, all around Australia, the red line is Sydney. Um, there was a bit, of, a bit of negative, but if you got out of the market then when he was saying to, you would have missed all of that boom that we've all had and uh, that would have been a sad story. So why do you invest in property? You're here to learn about property. Why do you want to do that? Here's an example of getting your timing right. Dulwich Hill is a nice inner west suburb. Example of a little semi that traded in 2013. I'll just flick back to that 
Last slide, 2013 was here when things were pretty flat, not much happening. Uh, sold again in 2016 for $755,000 more. There's a great example of getting your timing exquisitely right in the property market. Um, when it comes to your timing, Oops. When it comes to your timing, this is an example of what a property cycle looks like, the four stages of a cycle. Um, right now, we are in this part of the cycle in Sydney, and particularly, this is evident in the Sutherland Shire, where we are right now, and, and broadly across Sydney. That doesn't mean everything moves with averages, but yes, we are coming off the boil. This is still positive growth. We're still getting positive growth. We're somewhere here. Um, there will be a little bit of a dip. There will be negative pricing. We've heard about it in the, in the news right now. Uh, New South, or Sydney has gone through, a, there's been a 2% decline in median house prices. Um, you look at the sale price of apartments in Rosebury today compared to 12 months ago, they are down and they're down about 10%. They're, they're, the, the prices that they're selling apartments off the plan for now. So that's a, that's a significant decline. Um, I would argue that 10% uh, is only a, a correction after you've had all of these years of strong growth that we've had in Sydney. But to cop a 10% correction on a one and a half million dollar house that you just bought and six months later it's worth 10% less, that's 150 grand and that's heartbreaking. So you need to understand where we are in the cycle if you're gonna make an investment decision. Um, and so arguably there might be better places to look where you can capture some of this upside for a few years before you've got a ride out. We've got a uh, record, record high median house price in Sydney. Um, rental yields aren't very good. So if you're looking at it from an investment perspective, you will be tipping in a lot of cash. Uh, looking around Sydney, some statistics that we get from CoreLogic, that's the primary data producer for, for um, property information. Uh, these, are, these are arguably all great areas to live, very enviable locations, even some down uh, near where we are, but you can see Harbourside, 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 not so great. Um, so it's, this is not the end of the world. None of these people are going bankrupt. Um, um, don't shed a tear for someone at Point Piper that's done nearly 20% because they'll be, they, they have done 35% in one year, just a couple of years back. That was a particularly strong performing suburb. So it is just a correction. But as I said, if you cop a correction at the top of the cycle, you're going to wear um, a, big, um, uh, a, a big loss. Now, for first home buyers, um, there's a, uh, I didn't write this, uh, and it's, it's really cheesy, um, but uh, buying power is coming back. If you are attending auctions and just looking and having, and I do thoroughly recommend that, even if you are not in a position to buy, get yourself to, to, a, to an auction of a property that you like the look of. Give yourself a bit of research and, and, and try and pick where it's gonna land at auction and then go to the auction and see how the auction goes. Watch how the auction moves. Have a look at people's behavior at auction, see how real estate agents deal with, with potential buyers and see how, um, I, I go to auctions now, we don't even buy property at auction at Suburbanite. Um, we think that's a bit of a risk for our clients, but I still attend auctions now and then to keep my eye in, to see what the market's doing, because it's a great indicator. If you've got one bidder at an auction and they're taking bids from that one bidder and they bid and they, 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 they stop well below the reserve price and then they negotiate with that person, they make one more bid and they go one, two, three sold on that buyer. That has sold at auction. That maintains their 100% clearance rate record for the weekend. But that wasn't in sell at auction, that sold for 200 grand under, under reserve, but it's still sold under the hammer and so they've called that an auction result. So make sure you get yourself to auctions because you will see that there is opportunity to be had in the property market now on the right type of properties. What I am going to talk to you about, and there was an article today in, um, oh, this week in Domain uh, about how you can get into the market as a first time buyer in a market that appears unaffordable. And it is called, another, another cheesy term, it's called, does anyone know what the term's called? Is it a chance for a lolly? <laughs> Guess? Got it, there you go. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Um, interaction, see? Um, it is called rent vesting, and it is, it is a bit of a, a tacky term, but it, it is about um, renting where you want to live and investing where you can afford to buy because they are too disparate things. If you want to live at Cronulla, 
uh, and uh, you, you like the lifestyle there and it's handy for work or, or such and such, you can't afford the 1.2 million bucks for the, one, for the two bedroom unit and that's a fact of life, that's what they're worth. Um, you can either mortgage yourself up to the hilt at the lowest interest rates imaginable and just hope that they don't change for 30 years, which is really, really hoping for the best. Or you can continue paying your, your 700 bucks a week rent for your $1.2 million apartment, which I think is a bargain. Uh, and you can invest somewhere else and invest $600,000 in another market where you're going to do all right. Um, some of the numbers around that, uh, the entry price into Sydney is about 600000 uh, uh, for a unit and about one mil plus for a house. And that's entry, that's, that's deep western suburbs housing. And that's a uh, pretty ordinary Harris Park apartment. Um, both of those I wouldn't recommend as, a, as, a, as, a, as an investment. And you're probably not the sort of place where you, where you want to live and particularly anyone in this room. So you're gonna have, uh, have to have a hefty deposit and you're probably gonna cop LMI on that, lender's mortgage insurance, which um, I'm sure uh, Nathan will chat about. Um, and you've, you've got to wear that, you've got to sign up for a mortgage for 25 or 30 years, and you've got to know that interest rates are as low as they're gonna be ever right now. They're only gonna go one way. It might not be this year or next year, but I've been a property valuer for nearly 20 years. I've been a property owner for over 20 years, um, and I, uh, I was looking at a, at a mortgage on a property that I bought 10 years ago, and we signed that mortgage at 8.5% interest, and that seemed really good. Uh, and I was just looking at the documents yesterday. So that's, that's, that's real life. They will go up. So if you're signing yourself up to your eyeballs now to buy a, buy a place you're going to live in, you're going to be stuck there and it's gonna, it, it could go beyond what you can, you can manage. So make sure you've got your head screwed on when, you, when, you, when you're looking at how much you're going to pay for something. Um, and you've got no tenant to help you pay that. So you've got, you've got, you've got no support there. Um, also, if you're investing in the city market at the moment, it's going to sit flat. You remember that slide about how it's going to be a bit choppy or whatever. You're not going to get capital growth that will help you with your, um, uh, help you with your negatively geared position. Like, like I said, $1.2 million apartment, getting 700 bucks a week rent. That's, there's going to be a gap that you need to make up to the bank. Uh, and you're not going to get any growth while you're, while you're chipping out, tipping out 50 grand a year in uh, negative gearing. Uh, you're not going to be making 50 grand on the capital growth. So um, rent vesting, it's, uh, there's, there's some good things here. Here's some of the points I picked in this article today. Um, you get your desired lifestyle. You get to live in Cronulla where you want to live or you get to live in the inner west where you want to live. Yes, you're paying rent. No, it's not dead money. It's a price you pay for a roof over your head in the place where you want to live. People that say it's dead money, um, they're arrogant or they, they don't really understand what you're paying for there. You're paying, yes, you're not investing, but if you are investing elsewhere, then it is the price you pay to live where you want to live. You go on holidays and you pay for accommodation. You don't just sleep in the car. Well, it's the same sort of thing. You, you, you want to live in, in, a, in a place in Sydney where you want to live. You've got to pay for that. Um, it expands your options. And this is where we come into play. When you're rent vesting, you get to, um, uh, you're not just focused on the market that you know. You probably, I'm, I'm making some assumptions here for the room, but you probably know the Sutherland Shire reasonably well. The bits you do want to live, the bits you don't, where you, where you went to school, where you want to send your kids to school. Um, when, you, when you're rent vesting, you can still do all of that where you want to live in, in the Sutherland Shire or, or wherever around Sydney, but you get to invest in a market that's going to perform. You want to invest, you want to see your, your, your investment grow, um, then you get to open yourself up to other markets. When you're rent vesting, number three, you get to um, own your own home sooner. So you can rent, keep renting here and going to work, uh, building up your, your, building your career, building your, um, uh, your savings and invest somewhere else. And that is getting capital growth today. It's not going through that flat bit. Well, guess what? You can use that. We call that, that's a strategy that we use at Suburbanite. We call that your, your, um, your stepping stone strategy. And it's about using your, you've got your savings that you're building here. Um, you're building uh, capital um, appreciation on your investment property. You can do that once or twice. And then you've got uh, that whomping great deposit that you need to get back in the city. So it will help you get there quicker than saving alone. Um, also, you can... I mentioned about rental yields in Sydney, they're sort of around the two to two and a half percent. That's not a really great return on your money, especially if you're not getting capital growth at the same time. Uh, when you look around the country at other options, you can get into to areas that are a bit earlier in their property cycle, and they typically have a higher rental yield. What that means is that they're returning a higher return relative to the purchase price of the property. Um, 
what I would like to see for an investor is something in the four, you know, the low 4% return. So straight away you're getting almost double the rental return and you're capturing capital growth and you're doing it at a price that you can afford. So that's, that's, a, real, that's a real key advantage that we see for, um, for rent vesting. Um, oops, and um, oh, there's given another clue. Um, uh, and it's a, um, it could offset your own rent. So you've got other, other money coming in, uh, and particularly if you're getting a strong rental yield on your property, uh, you might be having outgoings of 400 bucks a week, collecting 500, uh, and you could use that 100 to upgrade and rent a nicer apartment in Cronulla um, or if they want to live. So blown the clue, um, so no one gets a lolly on that. I'll take that one. Um, where do we see opportunities like that? If you are thinking about rent vesting, it is a great opportunity to, to have a look. Now don't rush out of here and go on the internet and buy a place in Adelaide because it's not all good. But where, and that's back to that second slide where it says this is general advice. Um, I'm not joking, remember that my first slide, it had the Bulldogs, we did two presentations at the Bulldogs, the first one we talked about Geelong, second one we went back and one of the guys puts his hands up and says, oh, I did what you said, I went and bought a development site in Geelong, really? How did you find it a development site? Oh, the real estate agent told me you could develop it, oh, okay. Um, what suburb is in, oh, Corio. Oh, probably the worst, it's the third worst suburb in Victoria. For, for all, all, like on 22 social measures, it is the third worst suburb in Victoria. It is the zombie apocalypse. You've got meth heads walking up and down the street screaming at themselves. Uh, and that's where this guy bought based on, you know, oh yeah, we're buying property in Geelong, so don't rush out. Because Adelaide's got meth heads as well, we all know it. Um, but Adelaide has got a really, there's some, um, what we like about it is in that low price point, you've got lots of opportunity. And this is where we are capturing great opportunity for our clients. Why we like it, big infrastructure spending on health, education and defence. Um, the, um, they're, they're building a lot of boats, submarines there, 40 million bucks over 20 years. Um, that's, that's good long-term infrastructure spending. Uh, was the third most expensive building in, um, in the world, um, but they built some more shopping centres in Dubai and it's now num about number seven, but 2.4 billion. Started at about 2 billion, but everything blows out. Um, really good long-term uh, service type roles that can't be outsourced overseas. That's why we like the big health and education uh, um, uh, focus that Adelaide has. Um, also got other uh, sexy things like LA Casino getting a big redevelopment. Um, but it's not the big whiz bang city that everyone thinks of, but what it does have is it's got a really nice stable middle class and they're the sort of people that you want for your tenant. Um, and you can put a family in a good quality house in a reasonable proximity, proximity to the city and they can pay 400 bucks a week. Um, that's not sending anyone broke, that's covering your mortgage. And that's, a, that's, that's the sort of thing that you want to look for when you've got, um, when you're first time investing, you don't want to be taking risks, you don't want to be looking for development sites and big, big long projects and all those sort of things. You want to be focused on the nice, safe bread and butter stuff where you're going to get capital growth and you're going to get a reasonable rental yield that will help you carry that through that period. So. Um, Here's an example of a property that we're, and we are buying property. Here's a suburb that we are buying in. Again, don't rush out to Woodcroft and buy something, but Woodcroft is a suburb in Adelaide where we're buying property. I don't know if we bought anything this month, but we, we do. Um, this was bought this year, 360, oh, look at that, last month, $360,000, getting 360 bucks a week. So there's, um, they borrowed this, this particular investor, and the way you do it with a 100% loan to value ratio, where you borrow the whole amount, is you borrow the deposit off your house or off, you can do this with your, I noticed a couple of parents in the room, you can get a uh, family guarantee and they will lend you the deposit. That way you borrow 100% of the purchase price. Even borrowing all of that, they're out of pocket $60 a week before tax. Do your tax return and you get um, something of that back. Um, something else we bought, uh, it increased, this is we bought 12 months ago. Um, I don't know what suburb this one was in, but yes, um, purchased for 585, now worth 650, um, and that's in just in 12 months. Adelaide is, is a city that's, that's moving forward in terms of price growth. Also, when I mentioned Geelong, we are buying property in Geelong. Don't rush out, go there now, because it seems to be a lot of people are rushing out there and they're paying too much for property. Stuff we bought in December. Um, I bought property in, in Geelong in December for 425,000. It looks like it's worth about $500,000 now. I think that's too much and it's at a bad value to be buying it at 500, but people are doing it so they can fill their boots. How, when you're looking at investing and you're looking at your 
how I mentioned on another slide about people tipping in money. Um, you can get strong growth, you can get slow growth, you can get high yield and, and, and high growth property. So um, if you're looking at something that's got strong growth, it, and this is on like a $500,000 property, um, you want to be chipping in. Uh, this is, these are broad sort of ideas, but it talks about how much you've got to chip in. So if you can chip in 200 bucks a week to cover the difference between you've got your rent coming in, you've got property management, you've got interest, you've got rates, you've got insurances, you've got ma maintenance. Over a year, you're going to look at being about seven and a half to ten thousand dollars out of pocket and this is on a five hundred thousand dollar property but but here you're in a in a strong growth area so a low rental yield low risk low yield strong growth moving down the scale you get a bit of steady growth and a bit, a bit more balance um, and then when you're getting to the slow growth you're not putting in any money or in an area where you're getting a positive cash flow but here you're getting in the danger zone now just think about high school economics you've got uh, and you think about, you put your money in the bank and you get 2% return on it, but your money is safe. You will always be able to get your money out in an Australian bank if it's less than $200,000. All your money is guaranteed, but you're only getting 2%. If someone else offers you 6%, 8%, you know that, oh, that's juicy returns, but maybe my, my, um, my capital is not as secure. Same thing with property. If you see 6, 8, 9, 10% uh, rental return, um, that means that there's some volatility in your capital and that means you can lose some money on it. But you won't be putting in, you might be getting money each week thinking things are humming along really. This, this is what would I call a service department, something like that if you buy a, uh, in, a, um, in a service department type of investment. That's not a property investment, that's a commercial investment and you're taking commercial risks to talk about on another day but don't do it as a property investor, do it as a commercial investor. Do not do it, it's not a property investment. Um, so yeah, so with, with um, these strong growth, these are blue chip locations, these are, these are good suburbs where you've got nice leafy streets, people want to go, people want to send their kids to school there, people, people will buy or rent in that location just to send their kids to the local public school, it is that sort of location. Um, this is gentrifying areas, a uh, little bit iffy, um, not, your, not your forever home, but somewhere where you'll cop on the way up the ladder that you'll go, okay, well I can, I can um, I'll live in... Uh, uh, you know, I live in Campbelltown, it's got, it's got infrastructure, it's got schools and hospitals and sort of things, but um, you, know, you, you, want to get, you want to see things improving, um, things are gentrifying. And then your, your volatile high risk areas, these are, um, well, these are your, your Mount Druitts and things like that where um, you might, you'll get it up, you'll, you'll, you'll see prices go down and, and, and all things in between. Um, I don't have a pitch, uh, if you want to know more about us, we have a website, suburbanite.com.au. I've got my business cards on the table, the little square ones. Um, if you want, we can send you a list. This gets you on our mailing list. Um, but if you text your email address to that uh, phone number, we will send you a list of about 1,100 suburbs around Australia that in the last 12 months have retracted, have gone negative. It's probably not uh, super relevant, um, but I would just recommend that you get on our website, have a look at what we do. We buy property for investors. We don't buy prop. We don't uh, go to auction for first home buyers. Help them buy property. But what we do do is we do give free advice. If you've got a question about property, give us a call. My card is there. Give me a call. What I don't ever want to see is anyone get ripped off. And we give away that advice for free. We're not. Um, I'm not going to go and buy your first house, but I will help you try and help you not make a mistake. Uh, questions. Yep. Look, in the in the past, um, okay, I'll give you a bit of a clue on that. Um, in the past, that has uh, lasted. I'll show you. You can see it on a slide here, and this is this is reasonably accurate. There we go. So you can see here, um, and just look at the red line. That Sydney. Uh, I started being a value at here in 1999 and prices went really strong. They brought in first home buyers grant, they went off the chart, you know, over 20% growth. Isn't that nice? $14,000 to buy a block of land in Kellyville, they'd give you. Um, but uh, uh, steam came out of it, uh, they overshot, uh, interest rates went up a little bit. And then, so here's the correction phase, prices are negative. And this is Sydney, so everyone says, everyone thinks prices only go up. Prices were negative and they were negative about 5% on average 
Uh, I moved to Melbourne in that time because there was no work for property valuers in Sydney because there was very limited property transactions. I worked as a property valuer until about there. Um, and I even uh, sold a house about here and that was a bit of a disaster. Um, so you've got a couple of years, about two years of negative price. So that is, that's full on correction. Um, I came back to Sydney here and things picked up. And then at this point, this is a, again, this is a, a correction. Uh, prices dropped and they dropped on average again about 5%. What's 5%? Well, I was doing repossessions where property, the people had bought uh, here, like sort of 18 months previous, had retracted 20 to 30%. And that's not because the market went back 20 to 30 percent, but in specific examples, people have bought property that was in a market oversupplied, so they, they were buying uh, apartments in, in areas where they didn't need any more apartments. They were buying property that was, was flood affected or uh, just heaps and heaps of asbestos uh, with no, you know, like a, an old fibro house in a market that wasn't really looking for development sites. So this is a house they're living in. People don't want to live in those. So when, when things change, when you get, and that, granted that was a GFC, but that wasn't a GFC for, for commerce in Australia. We didn't, have, we didn't have a recession. So that was still a, a reasonably good time to be alive in Australia. Um, my la the last recession was when, back when I started uni. So there, this, was, this was just a, a, a time when the market went down. When the market goes down, it goes into a correction. Good property holds its own. Uh, you think if there are, if there are 50 properties for sale in your suburb and there are five buyers, that's a time for a correction. Prices are going to drop, and, but they're going to drop really harshly on the ones that are on the busy road, the ones that are under power lines, the ones that are under a flight path or, or um, flood affected or uh, on, a, on a triangular shaped block when everyone else has got a rectangular block. Um, they're going to, it's the properties that are compromised that are going to be hit the hardest when there are less buyers than sellers. And what that ends up, the, the, the long result of that is that you, your circumstances change, you need to sell that property, you can't sell it, it's worth less than what you owe on it. The only person that's gonna sell that is the bank that's gonna sell it from under you. And so you're in a, you're, you've put yourself in a really bad situation by buying a compromised property. The biggest takeaway advice today is don't accept compromises just to get in the market because now is definitely not the time to be doing that. Um, so if you cannot afford a property in this market, look further afield. Uh, get advice, but, but look at other opportunities because you will not, you, you will be buying in a market where there will be more sellers than buyers. And if your circumstances mean that you've got to change, you've got to change your position and get out of that, you've bought a compromised property and there are really good ones available for sale. It's going to be really hard to sell your, you know, three, you know, two bedroom fibro house on President Avenue or, or on the highway or, or next to where they're going to put the, the F6 through. Um, that's that's going to be a real like if yours isn't where the F6 is going to be and they're going to resume it, but next door to it, you're getting that compensation. Uh, you're going to have a highway that's going to first be 10 years being built, so you're going to have bulldozers every day, and then you're going to have a highway next year. No one's ever going to buy that off you, and the only way you sell that is to drop your price. So don't buy compromised properties. And yeah, that's that's how uh, corrections last for two years when things aren't really good, um, and it takes a while for the market to sort of get that um, sentiment that things are okay again, but poor properties will hit drop first and hold the longest until there's just enough dumb people around that, that, that can't wait for, for things to be, they go, oh yeah, I'll just buy it anyway. They put blinkers on and they look like that and they just see that that's their only chance to get into Caring Bar and they go, well, I wanna really wanna get a property in Caring Bar, but who cares if it's on the train line and it's you know, triangular shaped block that goes down you can't do anything with it it's got sewer running through this and that and all sorts of all sorts of reasons why it's a piece of junk but they got their place in carrying bail it's not that's not the way you buy property even if it is a place to live in i'm just wondering for our own research if you're thinking for the next two years you might want to buy in yep. two years what sort of websites would you suggest we do reviews on? look if wherever you're wherever you're looking um I think the best one is realestate.com.au. So you get a tip or you get an idea or, you, or you've just got some general ideas about somewhere, go on to realestate.com and have a look at what's for sale. Look at the volume of properties for sale. Look at the properties that have sold. This is a, a valuer looks at, compares the property they're buying to what has sold. That's in, in its simplest sense. That's what we do. We look for 
comparable sales in recent comparable sales um, and look at how many properties available for rent especially if, you, if you're going to invest you want to know and if you even if you're buying to live you want to see what the rental market is like if there are hundreds of properties available for rent it's flooded there's no way you would want to buy an investment property in that market um, that's that's uh, that's an apartment in Brisbane there's thousands of them available for rent um, so I would absolutely just go to realestate.com and have a look at what is available for sale today and, and you know, if someone gives you a hot tip on this on this suburb or this location, you want to know what that market's doing and why is it a hot tip. If there's not, you know, have a look at an, an example I'll give you is, uh, there's a town, uh, and it might not be current, but I looked at this a while ago, there's a town in Queensland, Dolby, and it was big on coal seam gas and so everyone got in there and, and when I looked at it about nine months ago, there were more houses for sale in this one town in Queensland, which is an hour or so from Toowoomba, than there are in all of the ACT, including Queen Bean houses, right? So there are more houses in this one town in Queensland than all of the ACT that, for, available for sale. So that tells me that's a ghost town. Just yeah, but they can they can sweeten it with all sorts of brochures and, and feelings about why this should be a good idea, and they can give you all logic as to why it is. Just have a look at what's for sale. That's that's your answer because the way as a property value, I'm I've got a negative bias on everything. Everyone is going to get divorced, they're going to get sick, their kids are going to get into trouble, they're going to lose their job, and all these things are going to happen at the same time that the market's not so good and you've got to sell your house. Well, you want to make sure it's not in a market that's flooded, you want to make sure it's not in a market that's oversupplied with whatever it is that you're selling. It's not compromised in any way. So that's, you, you just want to satisfy yourself that it's, that it's not a flooded market, an oversupplied market, whatever it is. Well, if you're looking at if you're looking at for for review, so we get our data. Um, so when we're looking at our when we're looking at a macro level to look at um, uh, you, one of the things we do when we do a strategy for a, for a client is we look at when we select some suburbs where we're going to buy property for them. We look at Australian Property Monitors, um, which is uh, the one that you get in Property Investor, which is I don't think they do the magazine anymore, but Australian Property Monitors has uh, good ten year data. So you would look at how are suburbs performed over the last 10 years? And so let's say that uh, uh, you know, Guy Mere, uh, houses in Guy Mere had a median house price of $600,000, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, and over the last 10 years, uh, had an average price growth of 5.8% growth. You think, well, that's not, that's not amazing, but if you look at Sydney as a whole, over the last 15 years, the median uh, the average price growth over 15 years has been about 6.7% compounding annually over 15 years. And we think Sydney's like the best place in the world for investing in property, but that's, what it, that's the truth of Sydney. So if you're getting around the 6% anywhere over 10 years, that's pretty good. What you want to see then is um, it hasn't just had a spike of, in the last two years, it's had a spike of 20%. So that's going to skew your average and it's due for a correction. Um, and you want to see that that 10 years of growth has been sustained by you want to go and establish locations. You want to see that it's got schools and shops, commercial areas that are active, transport links into the city, um, so that's easy uh, long-term for people to get to work, not just a highway because they clog up over time. Um, and you pretty much, um, unless you're uh, looking for a strong rental return, if you're looking for capital growth, you want to focus on capital cities. They're, they're where you get your capital growth. You get your rental return in regional areas uh, and you stay away from remote locations like holiday places, uh, mining towns. Now, everyone knows the horror stories of mining towns now, but they sounded like a really good idea five or six, seven years ago. Um, they were never a good idea. If it was a good idea, then BHP would build all the houses in the mining town for all their mining stuff, but they're not. So they're just, they're just remote locations that have a bit of a boom and then they bust and blow out for the next 20 years. So you want to find areas where you've got varied employment, lots of options, because that's, they're your exit strategies when you've got lots of options. You can sell the property and that makes a strong market to sell it in. But yeah, so data sources, uh, Australian Property Monitors, which is Australian uh, Property Investor Magazine use. We use CoreLogic, but you've got to pay for that. Um, but you can always ask um, your mortgage broker or your real estate agent, and they'll give you like some sort of property report that they can download for free um, about a specific suburb out of, out of RP data. Um, and yeah, realestate.com is a really good source because that just shows you what's happening in the market today. Thank you. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, why would you choose a variable interest rate over a fixed interest rate? 
Um, that's a question for Nathan. My, I've, got an, I've, got, I've got an opinion on that. Um, if you reckon you can outsmart the banks, go for it, but they're like casinos. Um, so I'd just take the variable rate and that'd be my, my way of going. Or you can, there's strategies of locking in part of it so you get the best of both. But um, interest rates are low. Uh, they'll probably stay low for a while yet. Uh, who knows what America's gonna do? Like they just put their interest rates up, but is that all that it is put our dollar down? Um, are we gonna put our interest rates up? I, I don't think so. There's lots of, I read lots of stuff around that. There's lots of arguments for it to go up. And there's lots of arguments for it to stay low. Um, but it is really low. And I know that it is new and it is a new normal relatively to historic sort of interest rates, but at one point it will go up. And if you're up to here with your mortgage at 4% and they go up to 6%, you've just seen a 50% increase in your mortgage. Not 2%, you've seen a 50%. So uh, it could easily go up 2% in 18 months. It's done that time and time again in the past. So uh, that's what I'd be concerned about if I was leveraging up to my eyeballs on a house that I was going to live in because you, uh, you, are your wages going to go up or your business going to generate 50% more profit in the next year for you to be able to afford a 50% increase in your interest payments. And, that, that, and that's what's scaring the, the life out of the banks and, and APRA and all the rest. And that's why they're doing, making these guys job harder than ever right now. If you've got any more questions, email me, text me, call me. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Gareth. My um, two key takeaways there for that one is if you're purchasing a property and it's not your forever home, if you consider it to be a stepping stone, potentially look at what other people are interested in a property, not just what suits you. So uh, you might be a young couple who are happy to live on level four, but have a think about what that means to somebody who's 55 or 60 or has a young family with kids trying to drag the pram up. If it's not your forever home, have a little bit of a think about finding a property that will be easily sellable when you go to sell that property uh, so that it appeals to a lot of people, you get good growth and it allows you to then move up to the next property. Uh, the other key takeaway was attending auctions. Uh, a little tip there for you. We've got Dalton House down at Sylvania there. Uh, that actually has an auction every Thursday night. They run about five or six back to back. So rather than having to run around and check out a whole heap of different auctions, you can go and sit in the one room and watch five or six different scenarios play out. So some will be a really popular auction where everyone will be bidding. Some will be a quiet auction where nothing happens. Others will have vendor bids. So you get to see a whole heap of different styles of auctions all in one go. Um, so the first auction you attend definitely doesn't want to be the one you're bidding at. So if you can get familiar with the process, the terminology, uh, when it's on the market, what a vendor bid all means, uh, it means it's a lot more comfortable when you go to purchase your home. Let me just flip back and we'll get started on uh, the next speaker. So, uh, we've had a last minute change of speaker. Uh, Lisa from LJS Conveyancing has unfortunately had a death in the family over the weekend. Uh, so, uh, speaking here tonight is probably the last thing she wants to be doing. So she's on a plane over to New Zealand now to get with her family. Um, Blake works at Birdie Wealth. He's actually a mortgage broker, so he's not a licensed conveyancer, but she's been kind enough to give us all the information ready to go for tonight's seminar. So uh, he'll be running through the slides and the terminology for you. If there are any more specific questions, what we'll be doing is just jotting them down and emailing them out to you. So we'll present them to Lisa and get them back to you. Um, and uh, he'll jump in and go through that. But um, Blake is a, a mortgage specialist. He's been in the industry for five years now, and he's a Gen Y buyer himself. He actually only bought his first property last year. So he's sat on your side, he's signed the contract, he's sat with the conveyances, so he's got a really good understanding of that process. And day in, day out, we're dealing with conveyances and solicitors. So uh, a big round of applause for Blake, uh, jumping in and stepping in at the last minute. Blake, up All right, thanks Nathan. Yeah, as you can tell, I've been thrown in the, uh, in the deep end tonight, but that's okay. Um, thanks for everyone for taking the time to attend tonight. Um, I'm gonna hopefully shed some light on the things um, you need to know when buying your first home, such as what is a conveyance room, when do you actually need one? Um, what you need to do first? Other things like what are a private treaty? What's a 66W certificate? Um, what do you need to do if you want to go to an auction, and finally, what grants and stamp duty concessions are available to you and the eligibility criteria. So, first of all, for chocolate, what is a conveyancer? Can anyone tell me? Anybody know what a conveyancer is? Is it a top there, is it? Yeah, okay. No worries. Has anyone used a conveyancer before? Anyone used a conveyancer before in the room? 
Yep, one here. Okay, great. So basically, a conveyancer handles all the legal work involved with buying and selling property. Um, when you're buying, a conveyancer reads the contract, negotiates the terms, um, basically makes it more favorable, favorable for you and does all the things necess necessary to put the property in your name. And when you're selling a property, a conveyancer puts together the contract and does all the things necessary to transfer the name, the property out of your name. Um, as you're a first home buyer, you'll need a conveyancer as soon as you find a property. Um, and it's a great idea to contact your conveyancer beforehand just to make sure that everything's in line and everything's in order for your purchase. So, to-do list. First of all, first thing you do is you see your mortgage broker. So before you even look at a property, you should have a written pre-approval and make sure that the only condition before you buy and before your loan is approved is the property being acceptable to the bank. Your mortgage broker can see this to ensure that you're ready for, the, for when your offer is accepted. If you don't have your finance in order, you may find your dream property only to lose it to someone else because your finance wasn't ready, okay? So after you've seen your broker, next, that's when you see your conveyancer, okay? So it's always a good idea to have your professionals lined up and ready to act quickly. And a lot of properties are high in demand, so certain price brackets are very popular, so you might need to act really quickly if your offer has been accepted. Third and foremost, you'll have to contact the agent. So that's when you make an offer on the property that you like, okay? So this may take some to and fro with the agent to agree on a price, and if your offer is successful, then contact your conveyancer and your broker. Your conveyancer will take care of the legal paperwork, and your broker will finalise the finance. So, purchasing a property, there's two ways to do it. Um, private treaty is the first way. Can anyone tell me what the other way is for a chocolate? No one? Okay, it's private treaty and an auction, all right? Private treaty is just a standard purchase, okay? That's when, um, you know, the seller has a set price and they negotiate with the buyer through the agent um, to get as close to that price as possible. Um, the process of this way of buying is you make an offer to the agent. The agent will then negotiate between you and the vendor until you agree on a price. Once your offer is accepted, the agent will normally, but not always, ask you to sign the contract immediately and put down your 0.25% holding deposit. So the agent will exchange your contracts and you'll have five business days to get the property inspections, get your unconditional finance, and get advice on the contract from your conveyancer. It's important to note that the seller actually can't get out of that contract. And if you no longer want to purchase the property, then you can get out of the contract within this five day cooling off period. All right, the only thing that you will lose is that 0.25% deposit if you do decide to get out of the purchase within that five day cooling off period. Okay, so 66W, does anyone know what this is? Has anyone heard of this before? So write this down, make sure you make note of this because you'll need to know what it is when you're purchasing a property, all right? So when buying a property via a private treaty, so that's a standard purchase, um, this is when the vendor, the person selling a property, does not agree to give you a cooling off period, okay? So that means that you have to have all your property inspections, have your finance finalised, um, all the contracts looked at by your conveyancer before you actually sign that contract, all right? So when you do sign the contract, you don't have the five-day cooling off period, you don't have the chance to put down the 0.25% deposit, um, you basically put down the 10% straight up and you can't get out of the contract without losing that 10%, all right? So a conveyancer gives a section 66W certificate to say they have explained the contract and the consequences of having no cooling off period. Um, and unfortunately this way, until you're ready to exchange, um, you're at risk of, of losing that property to someone else who um, you know, wants to buy it for a higher price, okay? So who here has been to an auction before? Anyone here been to an auction? Yep. Everyone knows what an auction is? You've all seen it, you've all watched the block, you've seen when they finish all the properties, at the end they, um, they sell them off. So basically an auction is a competition in the open market. Um, and when attending an auction, you must do all things as if you have been successful at the auction, which can be expensive with no certainty. So it's almost like purchasing um, with that 66W, so there's no cooling off period, there's no chance to get everything organised, you have to be ready to go before the actual auction, okay? So first of all, make sure you have a valid pre-approval. 
Um, obviously, the only condition being that, you, that the property um, is acceptable. You must get property inspections done before the auction, so you're building in pests and all that sort of stuff. Um, now, sometimes the agent will supply reports, but they're not independent and maybe out of date, so it's really important to make sure that you get those reports done independently yourself, okay? Um, you must get a copy of the contract sent to your conveyancer before the auction. So your conveyancer will give you advice on the contract and ask for changes um, because these changes can't be made once you've exchanged. So once you've won the auction and you say, oh no, you know, I want to take this out of the contract, well, bad luck, you're locked in. Um, and you must have a deposit ready in case you're su successful. So you have to have that, um, you know, your 10% or a deposit bond ready on the day to put down because if you win the auction and you don't, well then you could be in a bit of strife. So, for a chocolate, I want someone to answer this question as well. Who here can tell me what happened on the 1st of June, 2017, that's helped all of you guys get into the property market? Anybody? Superannuation saving thing? Uh, nah. Nah. That's right. I'll give you chocolate anyway, because you, you had a crack. There you go, mate. Anyone? Anyone else? Yes. There we go. All right. This is a bit of a... Oh. Nice. So yeah, that's it. We had um, Premier Gladys Berejiklian announced um, the housing ability reforms. So there's the stamp duty exemptions and the concessions. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about these. So there's no stamp duty is payable in properties valued up to 650,000. Um, and there'll be a concession for properties in between 650 and 800,000. Um, on vacant land, there's no stamp duty on properties up to 350. And then there's a concession from 350 to 450. Then there's the, um, the grant of $10,000. So if you're buying a brand new home valued up to $600,000, well then you may be eligible. So if you're applying through your bank and you need to put this $10,000 towards settlement, um, well that's when you would apply through your bank. If you just want the money afterwards and you don't need to put this money towards settlement, well then you just uh, apply directly through the Office of State Revenue. Um, if you buy vacant land to build your first home on, then the total value of the build plus land um, can't exceed 750000 um, So you apply for the grant when you enter the building contract or if you're an owner-builder after the slab is laid. Um, if you do not enter the contract to build within 12 months of buying the land, well then the, OS, the Office of State Revenue will require a valuation on the land at the time that you do build. And if that valuation has gone up, well then you may not be eligible for the grant at this point. Okay. Um, so who qualifies for the grants and exemptions? Um, can anyone tell me? For a chockey, throw another one out there. Does everyone apply? Every first home buyer? Anyone buying a, a property? Yes or no? Someone? Oh, Yeah, that's all. I'll give you, <laughs> give you a chockey. Yeah, that's one. Any other sort of criteria that you have to meet? Anyone knows of? Age Australian age citizen, yep. There you go. Age criteria? Uh, there is. Do you know what it is? Uh, no. <laughs> no, it's close. No. Um, anything else? Anyone else? No, okay. I'll run you through them now. Um, so basically, there's obviously the thresholds. You have to be under or within the thresholds. Um, you must be buying the whole property and not just a share from the seller. You must be over 18 years of age. Um, you and your partner mustn't have owned any residential property in Australia previously. One of the buyers must be an Australian citizen. You must not have previously received any grants or concessions. Um, and at least one purchaser must live in the home for a continuous period of six months within the first 12 months from the date of settlement. Um, unless you're a member of the Australian Defence Force and both purchasers are the, on the electoral roll. Um, so for the grant... Yep. Yep. I'll go back. Point two. Yep. Yeah. Um, if you're an investor, yeah, if you've purchased up to 2000 okay, 1st of July 2000, I think is the, I'll have to double check that, but one second. For this, for the exemption, I know for the grant, you, you, still do, you still do qualify if you've purchased an investment property after 1st of July 2000. Um, 
as long as you haven't lived in it a continuous period for more than six months. But for the um, concession, I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to find out. I'll get Lisa to get back to you on that one, okay? So for the, um, for the grant, um, the eligibility criteria is the home must be brand new and not exceed 600,000, or if buying vacant land to build on, um, the build, once it's built, can't be valued more than 750,000, okay? Um, have to be over 18, can't have received any grants previously, um, at least one buyer must live in the home for a continuous period of six months in the first 12 months. Um, Australian citizen, and again, yeah, you, you can qualify if you have owned residential property um, past 1st of July 2000, um, as long as you haven't lived in it for more than six months. Okay, so who here has thought about purchasing a property with a family member before? Anyone? Raise your hands. Anyone thought about buying with a brother or a sister or yeah, a parent, something like that? Um, does anyone know if you're still eligible for the grant? Yes or no? Can anyone tell me? So, provided the person you're buying the property with is not your de facto or spouse, you'll still receive the stamp duty concession as long as you purchase at least 50% of the property, okay? And the stamp duty concession is calculated on the proportion you're purchasing. If you're purchasing 95%, then you receive a full stamp duty exemption. If you have a partner and they've owned property in Australia before, then generally you will not be eligible for any of the grants or concessions, okay? So for the grant, you need to be buying 95% or more of the property to get the grant. And if you or your partner, um, you or your partner cannot have owned property post um, 1st of July 2000, okay? All good. No worries, guys. So basically, in summary, everyone's, everyone's circumstances are different, all right? It needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, everything I have discussed tonight is generally in nature. And I don't expect you to remember everything. It's your major's job to be here to help, okay? Um, but all you need to remember basically is one, see your broker, two, see your conveyancer, and then number three, you'll be in a position to you know, make an offer at an auction or to um, make an offer to an agent, okay? So my, my slides tonight weren't as long as Gareth's, obviously because this isn't my specialty. Um, I'll try and answer your questions that you have now, but Anything that I can't answer, as I said, we'll get that back to Lisa and Lisa will answer those questions via email, okay? So any questions on that so far today? Any um, conveyancing questions that you'd like me to answer? Or is everyone pretty, uh, yep, up the back. Yep, borrowing capacity. So um, with borrowing capacity, that's where you speak to your mortgage broker. So sit down with your mortgage broker, they'll run you through that. Um, they'll get all your information and they'll be able to do an analysis based on your actual circumstances. And it does change, it does go up and down. Nathan will speak a bit more about that in a minute when he comes on stage, it's, that's his piece tonight. But um, yes, that's, that's something that you need to speak one-on-one -on -one with the broker. Um, I guess, you know, lender policy changes and the way they actually assess um, your borrowing capacity does change. It's not massive. So if you have a pre-approval in place and that lasts for three months, well then you'd be safe to say that it shouldn't change too much if it does change a little bit. When you do find a property, if you did have a pre-approval, just speak to your broker and he can run the capacity again, okay? And that's how you'd know that you're safe there and that you're not buying and, you know, buying for too much, okay? Yep. Um, so this 66W certificate, yep. there's no cooling off period, why would a seller use that? A seller? Um, uh, the vendor, the seller, would probably use that just to get, uh, I guess, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. You know, sometimes they probably just want a commitment straight up. They might be trying to sell it quickly. Um, it, it just means that they, there's no period where the buyer can actually pull out. Who knows? You know, the, the buyer could, the seller, sorry, could have a, a property that has, um, you know, issues like building issues or um, termite issues and they might not want you to have that five-day cooling off period. Um, but, I mean... You, you want to get those those sort of inspections done prior to the contract exchange, anyway. So, yeah. What's that? 
it does rise sometimes. It's important to know what it is, so if it does pop up, you can say, okay, um, there's a 66W, your conveyance will speak to you about it, and sometimes they can take that out of the contract. Um, like I've had clients before that have had a 66W taken out. Um, I've got one at the moment where they won't. So it's just important to know because you know, once you do commit to that purchase, you can't get out of it, and you could lose 10% and then, and then some. You know? So you know, first home buyers these days are saving up so much cash. It takes you so long to save up that 10% deposit that if you do enter a contract that you want to get out of and you know, you're going to buy something that's going to put you in a worse off position then you do get out of it, well, you could lose that 10% deposit that you've just spent so long saving up for. So it's really important to, if there is that 66W, get your checks done before you do enter the contract, okay? Any other questions yet? Is a 10% deposit still enough or are lenders looking for like 20% that you've got to save up? Yeah, yeah, so 10 is still um, okay with some, most lenders. Generally, the, again, this is for Nathan. He's doing the, the mortgage broken piece. But um, yeah, the, the sort of minimum you'll need for an owner-occupied purchase would be 5% plus your costs associated. Okay? So yeah, th that 20%, that's just to avoid lender's mortgage insurance. All right? So if you have 20% plus costs, then you won't be charged that. But if you have anything less than that, well, then you, the lender will charge you that lender's mortgage insurance fee. Okay? Nathan will talk a bit about that. All right? Any other questions at this point, guys? All right, beautiful. Nathan's up next. Well done. That was uh, a big ask, asking someone to jump in with 24 hours notice and uh, speak on somebody else's slide. So well done, mate. Um, my main takeaway from that was really that order in which you need to see people. So make sure it's the broker, the conveyancer, and then start your property search. Please don't fall in love with the property and then, then start those uh, proceedings because you just won't have enough time. Good property sells quickly. It'll be gone before you get your pre-approvals lined up and your conveyances done their checks. All right, now we're going to talk all things finance, numbers, interest rates. Um, at school, did anyone play any sort of representative sport at all? Hands up if you did. Any dancers? Anyone a dancer at all? Yes? Yep. Not me, right? I do numbers. Numbers is my thing. Didn't do sport well, didn't do dancing. I just do numbers. So that's what I do well and that's what we've got a clear understanding of and what we're going to go through tonight. So tonight we're going to touch on five different topics. So the first one we're going to talk about is how Birdie Wealth can help you and how brokers can go about actually helping you. How to work out and identify which loan is right for you. So there's a question over here before about fixed rates or variable rates. So how do we determine which product is actually right for you? We're going to talk through five steps that you can do to increase your chance of actually getting your loan approved. So if you're not ready to buy a property at the moment and it's a year or two years away, what are some steps you can take now to increase your chance of actually having that loan approved? What deposit, was a good question before, what deposit do you need to purchase a property? So we're going to look at different purchase prices and have a look at what the minimum contribution that you have to make is in order to purchase that property. And we're going to talk about how you can buy a property without a, first, uh, without a deposit. Uh, so they're the, they're the five uh, main topics we're going to touch on today. So does anybody know what a broker does? Anyone? No idea. Yep, shop around, find the best deal. Anything else? Compare the different loans out on the market. Yes, compare products, absolutely. Any other questions? Any? We do that process for you as well. So our role is to really simplify the home loan process, take your hand and walk you from today all the way through to when you get the keys for the property. So the main things we're doing is simplifying that process and actually guarding you and protecting you and walking you through that process. We're comparing a few hundred loans. So most brokers have about 30 lenders on the panel and each bank will have somewhere between 15 to 20 different products. So we're comparing all of those, filtering them down and working out which product is right for you. And uh, that way we can potentially save you money and a lot of effort in shopping around and looking around. Uh, for a chocolate, how do brokers get paid? So how do we earn money? Any idea? Caramel ones, I've got good ones. Get paid a commission, yes. Yes, yeah, so that's right. So there's a, a second way that we get paid. Sorry. Um, we get paid in two ways. So we get paid an upfront commission and we get paid a trailing commission. Uh, this isn't payable by you. It's paid by the lender uh, to refer the business across to them. So we may put you with a lender that you weren't particularly thinking of or uh, 
or put you with a lender that potentially doesn't have a presence in the Sutherland Shire. So for them, there's no cost for me to have the office and have the staff and manage it. But uh, a lender, say, maybe like Newcastle Permanent up in Newcastle or Suncorp, uh, predominantly based in Queensland, might be able to get a loan from somebody in the Sutherland Shire. So that's a benefit to the lender to pay us a commission. Um, the product you get is exactly the same as if you walk into the bank yourself. So there's no cost to you to use the broker. There's no hidden commission. There's no tack on the, the top of the uh, interest rate. It's exactly the same. So we get paid upfront for setting up the loan. Uh, we also get paid a trailing commission. So the reason I like to highlight that is uh, we set the loan up for you, but we're still there after the loan is actually settled and established. We're still being paid, so you can continue to use our service. If you're not getting the answer that you want and you get stuck in that cycle with a bank on 1300 calls and getting moved from department to department, hang up the phone, call us and say it's not working, fix it for us. And we can jump straight back in and look after your loan as well. Um, the other thing we do at Birdie Wealth is we actually review your loan every six months. So we will get an audit on your statements. We'll run through and check that you're on the correct interest rate and that new to bank clients aren't getting a better offering than you're getting at the moment and that you're paying the correct fees for the product that you're on. So we'll be auditing and managing your loan uh, long term. So essentially what broker's doing is playing guess who? Did anyone have guess who as a kid? Right, my kids are getting a bit old and they're playing it now. I'm playing with a three-year-old and she's terrible at it. She just <laughs> cannot play with her. We play guess who, we've got all our lenders up and what we do is we start to have a conversation with you and we say, what are you doing for work? How long are you living in the property? What sort of deposit do you have? And as we answer those questions, it knocks out different banks until we narrow down to the ones you've got. Then we look at what type of product that you want, whether it's a fixed or variable, how long you plan to hold the property for, and we narrow down to the two or three best options that best suit you, okay? And then we present those products to you. So what does Birdie Wealth do different? Because all brokers do that. Every broker in Australia, there's 15,000 of them do exactly the same thing. So what do we do different? For us, it's not a transaction, all right? For us, our job is to give you peace of mind in your financial position and throughout your whole life. So at Birdie Wealth, 95% of our clients are repeat and referral clients. We don't get to a lot of new clients. They're mainly people we've worked with over a long period of time. And we aim to help them get into that first property, then step up into the home or invest elsewhere, continue renovation. So we work with those clients over that long term and uh, we set that plan up over maybe a 15 or a 20 year period or, uh, or 30 years if you can think that far ahead. Uh, quite often we want to talk about where you want to retire and work back from there. And so we're making sure that that first purchase, which is quite critical, is going to suit your long-term plan. All right. So how do we pick a loan that's right for you? Uh, the question we're asking is where do you want to retire? So we're looking as far forward as we possibly can. Uh, why do you want to buy the property? So are you buying a property because mum and dad said you need to go and buy a property? Are you buying a property because you're sick of living at home? Are you sick of renting? What's the purpose of this property and what does it actually solve for you? Um, so lenders are going to first of all have a look at your current position and they're also going to have a look at your past. What sort of things do you think lenders are looking for in your history or what you're doing at the moment? What are some of the things you think lenders might look for? Yes. Income, income? fantastic. Yep, so they're going to have a look at your income for borrowing capacity. Any other questions? Savings. Savings. Sorry, I missed that one. Where was that? Oh, here? Oh, you're going to be on fire today. You won't need dinner. Uh, yes, savings. Yep, so they're going to have a look at your savings. So they're not just looking at how much savings you've got. They're also having a look at your pattern and your habits of savings. Now, uh, there was a question up the back about the Royal Commission at the moment. Has anyone heard anything about the Royal Commission? Hands up. No? Fantastic. It's pretty boring, isn't it? It's some boring, boring stuff. But for us, it's really interesting because it is uh, affecting the way people are borrowing money and how you're going to borrow money in the future. Not only are they now looking at savings habits, they're looking at your spending habits. So they are scrolling through your statements over the last three months and they're saying, what are you spending at the pub? And why did you buy something at the baby shop? Is somebody pregnant? They are absolutely scrutinising every purchase and saying what was the purpose of it, what happened, why did it occur? So uh, that's something to be conscious of in this changing market is lending is becoming more difficult and banks are scrutinising statements. Now looking forward into the future, banks are asking those questions about where you're going and what are you doing, but as a broker that's something we want to be doing is sitting down and saying what's going to be changing over this next five, ten year period that could affect your capacity and ability to repay the loan. So if we're looking forward now, 
What are some of the things that we want to be looking out for to make sure that you can afford this property going forward? This that one? Job stability, yes, absolutely. So are you full-time? Are you casual? Are you self-employed? Um, are there any changes to that employment? Are you on contracting roles that may have an expiry date on it? So certainly they'll be looking at that. Uh, anything else? Any other loans you're going to take out? Any loans you're going to take out, absolutely. So we want to be talking through that and saying, are you about to upgrade the car? Are you going on holidays? Where are you going to need additional cash from? Absolutely. Anything else? I guess if I'm someone what is your income? What do you what do you you know, what is your outlook for uh, what do you want to buy? What is your goal? So Definitely. Yeah, so the first I'm not gonna throw a chocolate up there, I'm sorry, there's no way I'm gonna get it there. Um, so absolutely we're having a look at your long term plans. Where do you actually wanna be? What's the purpose of buying this property? Um, one we've missed here though is the family. So is there weddings coming up? It's often a big expense. So have we put money aside for the wedding? Are we looking to start a family? Is somebody going to be on mat leave? Are we going to have a reduction in income? At the exact same time, we've got an increase in expenses, right? So we're taking this loan over, over 30 years. Are we just able to afford the income using both of our incomes? What happens if one of the partners drops back to part-time work? What happens when we have a child who uh, suddenly needs nappies and daycare. Uh, how are we going to afford those things alongside the mortgage repayment? All made sense so far? All right, so really it's just asking what if questions. What if, what if this happens? What if this happens? And do we have an answer to all of those? All right, uh, let's increase your chances of getting an approval. Like I said, banks are scrutinising lending more now than they have ever done before. Um, I've been lending for about 12 years now. So back in the GFC, it was easier to get a home loan during the global financial crisis than it is right now. Banks are scrutinising absolutely everything when you're going for a loan. So here's five tips in order to increase your chances of getting an approval. All five of these you can begin work on now and get yourself in a position to purchase a property when you're ready. So the last thing we want is you come to us in two years' time and say, all right, I'm ready to buy a property. And I say, sorry, you've got to go away and start to develop this savings habit or you've got to get rid of that credit card and it delays your purchase. All right, first one, reducing personal debt. What sort of personal debt do we want to get rid of? Cars, yeah, car loan repayments, absolutely. They reduce your borrowing capacity significantly. So uh, car loans definitely uh, reduce that capacity. Any others? Credit cards, absolutely. So what do banks look at, do you think? Do they look at your balance or do they look at your credit card limit? Limit. limit absolutely. So it's what you can draw up to and take out. So if you owe $500 on your credit card, but the bank's being generous enough to keep bumping your limit up and it's up to $20,000, it reduces your borrowing capacity by around about $60,000. Right, so for every $1,000, it's about two and a half to three times that is what it affects your capacity with. So we may need to look at reducing credit card limits, closing credit cards, that's your personal debt. Another big one at the moment is afterpay. <laughs> dangerous, 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 all right? Doesn't matter if it's three payments or four payments, afterpay is considered a debt exactly the same as a personal loan. Yes? Does the hex debt make a difference? Hex debt does affect your capacity, absolutely. So that's generally shown on your pay slip. So uh, what the banks will look at is your gross pay, they'll take out the hex debt and then they'll lend to you based on what's remaining. Yeah, absolutely. Probably the last one I'd clear because the contribution isn't as much as say a personal loan or a, or a credit card is, um, but it could be the difference between getting the property you want or not. So yeah, definitely. They're the main ones. Next one, protect your credit file. Uh, your credit file is vital, it's important. Hands up, has anybody been given advice to go and open a credit card to boost their credit rating? Anyone heard that tip before? Go and open a credit card, go and get a personal loan paid out straight away. Have you heard that tip? Yeah. Bad advice. Don't do it, okay? In other countries around the world, they have what's called a positive and they have a negative reporting system. So what they do is they look at your credit report and they say, how many loans have they paid off will boost their rating up? How many have they missed will pull it down? In Australia at the moment, we just have a negative credit report. So they only show defaults, missed payments. Doesn't matter, you can take a home loan out and pay the whole thing off the next day. It doesn't affect your credit history at all, okay? What you need to be doing over the next two years is when you're, is limit the amount of inquiry that goes on on your credit file. 
Anytime you make an inquiry, so that's whether it's for a credit card, a personal loan, an electricity bill, when the banks do a, when they do a check on your file, it actually puts a mark on your file. Okay, so have you ever seen online they've got those credit card applications, you just plug them in, 60 seconds you'll get an answer, that's marked your credit file. Okay, so if you have a few glasses of wine and jump on one night and smash out 10 reports, you'll have what's called a busy credit file and they'll actually block you from lending for about 6 to 12 months. All right, so be very conscious of submitting applications that affects your credit file. Every time you put a mark on it, it affects uh, how busy your file is. So it doesn't show the outcome, it doesn't show whether you're approved, declined, or you withdrew the application, it just shows that you've applied for finance. All right, if a bank starts to see a busy credit file, they say, look, we're not quite sure what's going on here. Are they changing their story? Are they, are they manipulating the applications? We're gonna step away from them for a while. Does that make sense? Next two years, just be conscious of what's going on there. Start to develop a savings habit. So saving money is great, savings habit is even better. Uh, start to automate that payment. That's the best way to do it. It's the, uh, it, oh, oh. We see people come in who try and do it manually, uh, but by far the most effective way to do it is to set it up automatically. So have a separate account where the savings goes across to. The day you pay lands, clear that savings straight out and just learn to live off the remaining money. So set up a budget, get that money out of there and then live off the rest. Uh, if you can start to show a bank that you can put aside a mortgage repayment, they're going to be far more confident in lending you money. They can say, look, these guys are already doing it. We can see that they can afford this repayment. It's already going into an account. Now, if you're renting, it's, it's hard, right? Renting and saving money is quite difficult. Banks will look at the fact that you have made rental repayments as well as what they call genuine savings to show that you've got a history of putting money aside because if you can pay your mortgage every month, then they're confident that you can pay a, uh, a loan off as well. Last, uh, last two I'll, I'll run through together, it's your work and residential stability. So in your employment, banks are looking back over the last three years generally to have a look at what you've done with employment. The less employers, the better, okay? If we have one employer for three, five years, nice stable client, nice safe client, we like that. If we have somebody else who's had 10 or 12 different jobs over that period of time, chopping around, will they be without income, will they not? That makes banks a little bit nervous. All right. Um, is anyone here self-employed? Yes. Um, yes, yes. So borrowing for self-employed certainly can be done. Uh, lenders are looking at anywhere between 12 months to two years of your financials. Uh, so it is something to be conscious of when chatting with your accountant about how we structure and set these financials up to get yourself in a position to, to buy property. So Coming into tax time, now's the time to be talking to them about how do we set these financials up to make sure that we're eligible to borrow because if you don't do it this financial year, you've got to wait 12 months and do it for the next financial year. Um, residential history is the same point as before. Nice, stable living, not jumping around too much. Yes. Yes. What if you um, go directly from one job to the next and it's higher? Yep, that makes yeah. sense. Absolutely, yeah. So, so it Yeah, if the story makes sense, the banks are happy with it. So um, does the story make sense? Were you a plumber last week and now you're driving a bus? And Does that make sense? But if you're saying, well, I was a, an accounts manager and now I'm a senior accounts manager and now I'm team leader, well, that story makes sense. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's not a specific time frame. Probably, probably three three properties in three years is is at the top end. It all depends. They look at your overall application. So, if if you've had to move five times because you've spent some time overseas and then gone back home and then rented back out, but other parts of your application are really strong, then that can boost it up. Um, it's it's mainly just making sure that if you can limit it, try try to limit it. Okay, the question before was uh, around deposits, minimum deposits, minimum contributions do you need? Uh, how much deposit do we need to purchase a property? So what we're going to go through is we're going to look at different purchase prices and it's going to have the minimum deposit required. It's going to have the costs associated with it and then what your total contribution is to buy. Now, bear in mind this is the minimum. This is the absolute minimum that you need. The more deposit you have, 
the less fees that you pay because we've got lenders mortgage insurance which we'll talk about quickly later. So look down the column, have a look at what price you're thinking of purchasing for. We need a 5% deposit as a minimum, as Blake said before, 5% is a minimum deposit, plus you then have your costs, you've got your stamp duty legal fees. What other costs are associated with buying a property? I love the phones now, we don't have to write it all down, just take the photo and off you go. Yes? Strata, yes, so that's a cost um, after you've purchased a property. But there is, a, there is something you have to do when you buy an apartment at the time of buying. It's something called a strata report. So you need to go through and have a look at the minutes on the, uh, the actual building and see is there any damages, what's happening with the levies. Um, yeah, so a strata report is certainly one that we have to come up with. Any other ones? Yes, building inspection. So building inspection is one, pest inspection. The amount of people who say, you know what, it's $450, I don't want to spend that money, I'll just risk it. It's absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. We had a, a uh, client last week who, uh, or last month, sorry, who purchased in Loftus. They'll actually given a, a pest report. At least it was a conveyancer on this one. So she picked up the fact that the pest report was six months old and it was given to them by the uh, vendors. When did their own pest inspection termites? Okay, so you must spend that money. The mistakes you make on property aren't $100 mistakes. They're thousands and thousands of dollars. So spend the money and do the report. Any other things we need to account for with costs? Yes? I have a question. Yes. Is there a case where you can get a list of all these reports? So when you go and see your conveyancer, um, they will be listing what reports are appropriate to the particular property. So depending on what style of property, They'll say, well, for this one, we need pest and building, or this one, we need strata reports. So your conveyance will, will order all those reports and do all of them for you. Okay. The other one, stamp duty, obviously, if you're jumping up in that price bracket, you can see where stamp duty kicks in. So you see the big jump there as stamp duty comes in. That's, uh, that's the main cost that you'll see there. There's a few other bank fees as well, and potentially lenders' mortgage insurance. Um, now, that term, has anyone heard that term before? Has anyone not heard that term? Never heard of mortgage insurance? Um, just quickly on mortgage insurance, it's not there to protect you, okay? A lot of people hear insurance and they say, fantastic, I've got insurance on the property. If I default, if something goes wrong, I lose my job, I'm fine. Lenders mortgage insurance is there to protect the banks. If you don't have a 20% deposit, you're considered a high risk. So banks take out insurance to protect them, all right? You pay for it, protects the bank, okay? So you still need to have a look at other things like income protection as well on top of that. Then there's mortgage insurance, despite the name, it's there to protect the banks only, not you. All right. Over, once you're over 80%, it's a fee depending on the risk. So it goes from 80 to 95%. So you put your 5% deposit in, then they set it there. It's wavered in some circumstances, but only a few. So some lenders between 80 and 85% will pay your mortgage insurance for you. All right, so if you have a 15% deposit, they'll cover the, the 5%. The other place that it can be wavered is um, some industry. So higher professionals like uh, solicitors, doctors, engineers can sometimes get a waiver on their lender's mortgage insurance. There wasn't some government initiative on it as well? What, the, what you may have heard of is that they got rid of, there was a tax on top of lender's mortgage insurance. So there was a duty paid on top of it. Yeah. They've removed that. So it's reduced the premium down a little bit. Yeah. Still there though, still there. Yes. Yeah, it varies greatly. So it depends on what your level of risk is. So once you're over an 80% borrow, uh, it depends on your risk. So it goes from 80 to 95%. If you're right up at 95%, you consider it a higher risk. I don't understand it. Yes. I, I would understand yes. If I have 600K, yes. Right? Yes. How much Sure. So it depends on what your contribution is towards the purchase. Okay. If you've only got 50,000, you're borrowing 95% of the value of the property. You're the highest risk you can get. Um, on a purchase of that, you're probably looking at around about 20,000 as a premium. Okay. Because you're a high risk. If you've got uh, 75,000 or 90,000, your risk rating comes down and the premium then comes down. Mm -hmm. So it's determined on what percentage you borrow and the loan amount that you take out. So as you move up, 750, a million dollars, it's a larger loan, larger premium. 
Okay, question. Yes, great segue. Fantastic. <laughs> Jumping into it next. Um, was there one more question up the back, Emma? Yeah, so um, your cross includes across the. Yes. Do they include LMI? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So I was thinking there might be Yep, total fees associated with including lenders' mortgage insurance. Yeah, yeah. All right, what if we don't have a deposit? How good was that segue? I planted someone in the audience. <laughs> All right, the family guarantee. Has anybody heard of this before, the guarantor? All right, so what we're looking for here is what's called a security guarantor. So this person is not here to help you make repayments on the loan. You need to be able to show that you can independently repay the loan. They're helping to minimise the risk to the bank by uh, putting some additional security up. All right, so the first property of security is the one you buy. So you are buying your home here. You found a property for 500,000 because it's a nice round number and it works really well with my scenario. So you found a property for 500,000, you need a loan of 505 to cover some costs and uh, some legal fees as well. So you've got absolutely no deposit and you're borrowing the full amount, 505,000. What will happen is you will borrow 400,000 against, uh, against the property itself. So this loan here for 80% of the value gets stuck against the new property. We've still got another 20% plus some costs there as well. This is where the parent steps in, okay? So if a parent has equity in a property, they may be eligible to be a guarantor. Uh, we can do it on close relatives as well, uh, but this is where a guarantor would step in. So what happens is that second loan is then taken on your new property, but it's also taken on the parent's property as well. So the parents actually, uh, the bank will hold title on that property until you're in a position to release it, okay? So if you're lucky enough to be in a position to have somebody who can help you with this, as a broker, we still need to assess that they are what are called eligible guarantors. So what we're doing is we're talking to them about what the likely scenario is. We're talking to them about what the worst case scenario is. So what happens if you default on your loan? What will happen to their particular property? And we're making sure that there's nothing coming up for them in the next three to five years where they may actually want the deeds to that property um, to do their own investing or to do a sea change or move where they want to move, all right? So we'll be having a meeting with you first of all to discuss the uh, loan, but then we have a meeting with the guarantors as well to make sure they're really clear on their understanding of what's happening. Uh, back to the Royal Commission, many of the scenarios have been around uh, inappropriate guarantors being put on a loan. Um, there was uh, a broker who put a lady who was blind onto an uh, application and uh, signed the contract away and lost her home. So it's under the spotlight at the moment. So what you may find if you have a guarantor is they may, uh, the, the banks again are clamping down on this particular area. They'll be needing to seek independent legal advice, independent financial advice, and actually have certificates signed off by solicitors and financial planners to make sure they have a clear understanding of exactly uh, what their obligations are. Any more questions around the guarantee? Yes. So does that reduce your lender's mortgage insurance? Yes, so from a bank's perspective, you're borrowing 80% of the value of both properties. Yeah, yeah, so your loan size, that total loan there is now 80% of the value of the, the actual properties. So in their eyes, you're no longer a high risk. You can have multiple guarantors. Um, our preference would be not to do that because it just overcomplicates it. Um, banks would prefer to have one person, if something went wrong, just one person is liable for it. Are you talking about like each set of parents, for example? Um, can be done if one person's got equity in the property, there's not really a need to do it. It just overcomplicates it and probably uh, makes the application less likely to go through. Yes? Yeah, good question. So uh, when, when or how the guarantor steps out is when you're in a position, uh, or ideally when the guarantor will step out, when you're in a position where you, your loan is 80% of the value of the property. So you've borrowed 100% or a little over 100%, you're gonna start to pay that loan down over a period of time. What's gonna happen then is hopefully we're getting some growth in pro property over a five year period. Once you're in a position where the loan is now 80% of the value of property, you can release the deeds and get them back to the parents, all right? It's really hard to give a time frame on that. So a couple of years ago, we had people doing it in nine months. So they buy the property nine months later, it's gone up by 20%, release the deeds. Um, in a softer market, you may be looking four or five years. Uh, there's so many variables. Perfect. Last one. 
Gareth has already touched on this, so I'm only gonna quickly talk about it. What happens if you can't afford to buy in the property you wanna live in? Uh, rent vesting, it was the word of 2017. Everyone was talking about it. We had magazines calling us saying, we wanna talk rent vesting, rent vesta. It was the uh, hip new word to use. Uh, they actually found that a third of investors were actually first home buyers in 2017. So all these investors out there, uh, yet 33% of them were actually people who had never owned a property before. They weren't seasoned investors. They were people saying, well, I can't afford to buy where I wanna live. I love where I wanna live. I wanna stay in this area. It's near my work, it's near my friends, uh, but I do have a deposit. I wanna get into the market. So rent vesting was an option. Um, Gareth as well and truly covered off on that. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, leave that one there. Last thing for you, this is about as big as sellers I'm gonna do, right? So just get ready for it. There's a book available, just printed yesterday called How Gen Y Buy. Um, I've gone around and interviewed 20 uh, different first home buyers on how they got into the market, what they did. So this has singles, this has couples, this has people who use guarantors, this has people who saved all the money themselves. Um, the only prerequisite for getting in the book is they can't have been gifted any money. So no one in here was given a handout and jumped straight into the market. They've all had to do it themselves through saving deposits and getting into it. Um, so it's there available if you do want to take one away and have a read of what other people in your exact situation did, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, it's 30 bucks and I'll be over there and you can grab a book on the way out, okay? But these are predominantly people in the Sutherland Shire because most of them are my clients. Um, yeah, and that's how they got into the market. So rather than me telling you how to do it or them telling you how to do it, hear actually how people have done it in the last couple of years. So some good stories in there. Questions? Yes? Yeah. Maybe twice interest rate that it might be now. Like yeah. Off the capacity. Yeah. But given that we're in a correction right now, mm. what what would you advise a buyer in terms of a, a future interest rate to appear? Yeah. So when banks are assessing your borrowing capacity, banks are working on seven and a half to eight percent. So there's two completely different uh, things with borrowing capacity. There's what the bank will lend you and there's what you're comfortable making repayments on. You need to do two separate calculations. So sometimes a bank will lend you a lot more than you want. Sometimes they'll lend you a lot less than what you want. So you still need to do your own individual budget and say what happens if, what happens if. Um, but I think somewhere around about six or six and a half percent is probably reasonable. Uh, banks are going right up, like I said, to seven and a half, eight. So they're saying that you can afford it if it goes to seven and a half or eight percent. Um, whether you can or not, it's another story. You might be living off noodles every night, but, uh, but that's what they work their numbers off. Any other questions? Yes. In terms of the age, you know, the age of the applicant. Is yes. It, um, is there an upper limit to which you know, a person can take? I mean, if, if a 55 year old, a 65 year old wants to apply for a, or a mortgage, is yep. there a kind of limit? Because they may not be able to pay yeah. off the age of 80 or 90. Yeah, good question. So, uh, you can't discriminate based on age. So banks cannot discriminate based on your age, it's illegal. Uh, what they can do though, is they can ask some more questions about your exit strategy, all right? So they'll be wanting to know what your plan is to pay this loan off. If you're taking the loan out at 55, they're gonna say, well, upon retirement, how are you gonna clear this loan off, all right? And we need to have a really clear plan on exactly how you're gonna go about doing that. Any other questions? Yes, yes. So if you already own an investment property and you want to now buy a home to live in, can you use it? Yeah, so you can, if there's equity available. So have you heard the term equity before? Does anyone not know what equity means? I'll run you through it any, just quickly, a quick scenario. So equity is the amount of property that you own, all right? So if you've still got 80% left on the loan, your equity is 20%. So you can potentially draw out equity of that property, so you can draw some of that out and use that to purchase a property. Yeah, so that is possible. All right. Yeah, so there's a superannuation scheme that came out uh, last year about making additional contributions towards your super. Um, it can be done, so you can do voluntary contributions on top of your uh, your minimum contribution. So that's what you can draw out only, not the minimum contribution you're making. It's additional contributions, mm -hmm. all right? However, when I calculate, oh, the, yes. yeah, the calculation yes. showed me that yes. you would get less <laughs> yeah. after three years. Yeah, all right. Then if you just put it aside. You're right. So, at home, under your mattress, 
<laughs> yeah. So the benefit of it, um, we've done the numbers too. So the benefit on, on it we've found is fairly minimal. Um, is if, uh, the numbers we run, there was a benefit, but it was fairly minimal, fairly minimal. And you had to be looking to buy a property in around about three years time for there to be any benefit. The issue is the three years is a long time. If circumstances change or you want to get that money faster, you can't get it out. It's locked in there, okay? So you can only pull it out if it's for uh, property purchasing purposes. So yes, it's there. It sounds really good. Where is the benefit? Is it because it's free tax? Yes. Okay, so that's the benefit. Yeah. Because from the numbers, yep. I didn't see any. Yep, benefit. absolutely, yeah. So because you're... Because it's free tax? Correct. Oh, okay. Exactly right. Yeah, so if you do want to do it, definitely get on the phone to your accountant tomorrow because it's in a financial year. You could get some money in there prior to that, that end of financial year time. Any other questions at all? As a mortgage broker, yes. where, like, where, where can you start with a mortgage broker as compared with like a financial planner? Mm -hmm. In getting your like finances in order, yeah. so where does the plan start? Where's the plan to start and where does the broker finish? Oh, no, yep. where does like, yeah, the broker start the plan? Like how many years in advance can it start? Um, we've had clients, so I just settled on a loan in March for a client we worked with for seven years. Okay. So uh, yeah. it's up to you. We're happy to get in contact with you as soon as possible when you're ready to start your journey. Um, you know, the first, the first uh, appointment can be just in half an hour, very general, very high level conversation about where you want to go, what you want to do. Here's some things I'm seeing in your application, which could be a detriment. Let's try and tidy those up. And uh, we'll touch base every year after that. So it's really up to you. Um, for us, as soon as possible. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Perfect. Any, anything more specific, come down and see me afterwards. Happy to answer those ones. Um, just finishing up really quickly, guys. You might have seen at the start, we are um, supporting Enough is Enough. That's our charity partner that we've been working with for the last 13 months. Um, they're a local charity. Uh, this event's put on at no cost to you. Um, we've covered the cost of it all. We've paid for everything. If you are in a position to do so, we'd love to uh, have you contribute a little bit of money to Enough is Enough. Um, we've got these really cool tins here. Blake, I'll get you to run that up the back. We've made them so they fit a $20 note perfectly. Yeah. Straight slides in there. So if you're in a position and you can pass it, can you mind passing that around? Um, we'd love for you to just throw a little bit of money in there. Um, at Birdie Wealth, these are our main charity partners. So rather than giving people a big settlement gift that they don't really want, uh, a bottle of wine that they'll drink and get rid of, what we do is we make a donation on your behalf to Enough is Enough. Um, and we've managed to donate uh, $12,000 in the last 12 months. So uh, their role really is to help people who are struggling with domestic violence and get them out of the home, uh, put them somewhere safe. Uh, they work with both the uh, defenders and the victims, so it's something a little bit unique and different that they do as they look at both sides of it. While that's going around, guys, if you can just start to fill in that feedback form, we'll collect all of those, and then uh, we've got a uh, prize. We'll draw one out, a beautiful bottle of bugger lugs. <laughs>